This is CBC Here and Now. Politicians in the House of Assembly are pushing for details about exactly how an Atlantic loop that includes power for Muskrat Falls will work. If we don't do something, electricity rates will spiral out of control. It's our asset. asset. We should maximize the benefits for us here. People of Newfoundland and Labrador need to know what is happening to their power rates. Some snow in the air today, but some warmer temperatures are going to move in midweek. I've been a big guy all my life. Uh, I think every day I would wake up heavier than I was the day previous, and uh, I knew that wasn't sustainable. Small steps lead to a big payoff for this man from Old Perlican. Why he decided to make a major lifestyle change at the start of the pandemic. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. Now we have reaction tonight to yesterday's federal budget, including a brief reference to the Atlantic Loop negotiations. Yes, the Atlantic Loop was mentioned once in the federal budget, but today the provincial government is being pressed for more information. The Loop is expected to be part of the solution to Newfoundland and Labrador's financial crisis. But today in the House of Assembly, some politicians say the details have been kept secret. Here and Now's Mark Quinn reports. Right now, the Atlantic Loop is a vague idea about a way to provide green energy for Atlantic Canadian provinces that somehow includes Quebec, Ottawa and power from Muskrat Falls. It was the first thing the opposition asked about in the House of Assembly today. I asked the Premier, can you update the House on the progress of the Atlantic Loop negotiations? What will Newfoundland and Labrador have to give up in order to make it happen? We all know that Newfoundland and Labrador has an abundance of green, clean energy, and we can be the battery that powers the northeastern seaboard, but we won't do so in sacrificing to Quebec. We will make sure that we have our fair share. Outside the House, Fury said negotiations with the federal government on a solution for Muskrat Falls are ongoing. He said that's the first step in building the loop. He didn't provide more details, but he did say that selling the federal government an equity stake in the hydro project is one possibility. But that's certainly something on the table, and uh, we'd be well, we'd be open to that. I mean, the, the project is so big; it's ballooned out of control. Um, we, I mean, frankly, we can't. The, the fiscal capacity of the province can't sustain that hit. Again, Fury committed to keeping electricity rates to 13.5 cents per kilowatt hour. 13.5 cents was always to commission, and after that, the rates would be set by the PUB as they always have been historically. The opposition leaders say the Atlantic Loop was first mentioned in a federal budget two years ago, but since then, negotiations to develop it have been disturbingly secret. There must be some progress. Why wouldn't you report some progress? You must be moving things along. You know, if Atlantic Canada is to benefit from this, and particularly Newfoundland and Labrador, I mean, we have the asset. Muskrat Falls is the asset here for Atlantic Canada. And if Quebec is involved, that's fine. But we have to ensure that the decisions that are being made are not made in a boardroom in Quebec City. They're made somewhere in Atlantic Canada, that benefits the people of Atlantic Canada, but particularly the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. People of Newfoundland and Labrador need to know what is happening to their power rates. We hear too many people who are leaving. We hear too many people who cannot afford their power rates, let alone for waiting for them to go up. And we know if the rates go up, our goods and services are going to go up too. So this is a vital question. Premier Andrew Fury is asking the public to stay patient. He says he'll be happy to share substantive details of the deal when they become available. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the House of Commons is debating the federal budget today. $100 billion dollars in stimulus Quebec. measures were announced Quebec. today, including $30 billion for child care over five years, the extension of pandemic-related wage and rent subsidies, money for jobs, and a federal $15 minimum wage. Jillian Pearson with the group Parents for Affordable Child Care NL is pleased to see the money for a national child care program. She believes it will help more women enter the workforce. So one of the most telling uh, outcomes from Quebec system is that they have the highest uh, woman workforce participation rate across all of the OECD countries. And that's essentially attributed to their longstanding affordable child care system. So all of the research shows that when you have accessible, affordable child care, that more families and particularly more women uh, can get to work in the workforce. 
Well, Pearson says she's remaining cautiously optimistic because of talk there could be a federal election this year. Oh, this budget has to survive another election. So I will be cautiously optimistic and uh, hope that we can hold the government's feet to the fire in terms of this investment. But we really need to make sure that this is not just announced, but also implemented. Well, as you just saw, some cautious optimism about that $30 billion announcement for daycare. But what about our older people? Well, consider some numbers that the province released today. 50 years ago, there were 200,000 children in the province and just 30,000 seniors. Today, 70,000 children but 120,000 seniors. Rob Greenwood is the director of the Harris Center with Memorial University. Now, Rob, when you look at the data, what do you see in the future in terms of the demand of childcare versus long-term care? Well, obviously, seniors care, long-term care is growing and will continue to grow. And so the supports are really essential. Children's needs in the province, we know fertility rates have dropped. They're not gonna increase, very unlikely. We need to do everything we can though for family friendly policies because in large part, every worker we have is gonna be more essential now and into the future. So good daycare support is gonna be needed so that every possible member of the labor force is gonna be available. So we really need to be more innovative with the way we provide that with a dispersed population, with smaller population. And so both are needed, but one size does not fit all. You know, you, we've spoken in the past about what's happening with the population in Newfoundland and Labrador and, and what the trend looks like. How are we going to find a balance between what we need to do for children and working parents versus what we need to do for, for Nan and Pop? Well, it's not easy and they are connected. We all know, of course, families often depend on relatives for help. And in many rural areas, that continues. When you look at the Northeast Avalon, our numbers are very similar to urban areas across Canada. So I think the real key is going to be policies and programs and supports adapted to the nature of the region. And a lot of it is going to mean we're going to need to do things in new ways. What worked 50 years ago, 30 years ago, isn't going to work in the future. So one possible solution then might not be these long-term care centers, but maybe finding ways to keep seniors uh, staying at home longer, maybe? I think that's very much part of the plan with the, the health accord work that Pat Parfrey and Sister Elizabeth Davis are working on. Uh, I don't pretend to be a, an expert in that area, but I know the uh, center at Grenfell campus of Memorial that focuses on aging research has done work in this area. And that's gonna be really key to find ways so that seniors can live at home longer, but also so that they're not isolated, because we also know that people need that social interaction to stay healthy. All right, Rob, always a pleasure. Thank you very much. My pleasure, sir, always. Meanwhile, the St. John's Board of Trade is happy to see wage and rent subsidies continue along with a new hiring program. It says those programs will be helpful to get businesses back on their feet after the pandemic. But in a statement, the board says it is concerned about ballooning debt. Canada's net debt is now at an all-time high, more than $1 trillion. The Board of Trade says it is pleased there is a plan to reduce spending to more sustainable levels as the impacts of COVID-19 subside and our economy recovers, we encourage close monitoring and persistence to ensure this goal is achieved. Well, the Federation of Labor is also pleased to see supports in place to help people get through the pandemic. It's not just physical infrastructure, that the care economy and social infrastructure is very important. It's very important to put uh, money in the hands of all Canadians and to help those who are falling through the cracks, uh, to help small and medium businesses see their way out of this, to help those industries that have been, um, that have been uh, hit the most. And that government's job is not to balance the budget, but government's job really is to uh, take responsibility for the health and well-being of uh, the people of this country. <laughs> Thank you.
There's no denying that it has been a wet April for St. John's. In fact, 16 of the last 20 days we've seen rain and we've seen so much rain so far. 213.8 millimeters that were less than 50 millimeters away from the all time record uh, set back in 1951. So we certainly have a few more days to add to that. It is looking like we're going to see uh, a little bit of dry weather over the next couple of days. This is a high today, five degrees. We saw some snow for parts of Labrador. I mean, uh, through parts of the uh, northeast coast, two degrees in Gander today. There's that area of low pressure that's going to move off. Things are going to be dry over the next couple of days for some areas, but I'll get into those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Nunavut MP Mumilak Kakak isn't apologizing to Labrador MP Yvonne Jones for questioning her indigenous identity, but she is acknowledging that she made a mistake. On Friday, Kakak tweeted, Jones is not an Inuk. That was in response to a 2019 post from political blog Indigenous Politics. Well, yesterday, through the House of Commons, Jones demanded an apology. Jones is a member of the Nunatuavut Community Council, a non-status group of about 6,000 Inuit from southern and central Labrador. The group formed as a society in the 80s and largely identified as Métis until 2010. In a statement to CBC, Kakak said she didn't realize Jones claimed Inuk identity when she sent the tweet. She also said there is much debate around Nunatuavut and whether or not that should be recognized as Inuit. She also said that the conversation around identity and reclamation of identity is an important one. After having conversations with other well-respected Indigenous people, Kakak said she realized she may have made a mistake in missing the full picture. Jones had asked the NDP MP to withdraw her statement, but Kakak has not deleted that tweet. Well, two more cases of COVID-19 in the province today. One is a woman in the Eastern Health region in her 20s or 30s, and her case involves travel within Canada. The other is in the area covered by Central Health. It's a man in his 40s, and that case also involves travel within the country. Now, due to one of those cases, Public Health has issued another flight advisory. Anyone who traveled on Air Canada Flight 8018, 8018, a flight that left Montreal and arrived in St. John's on Sunday, is being asked to get tested. Well, with nine new cases today, Nova Scotia's numbers are climbing, and many of those are also linked to travel outside the province. So just as Newfoundland and Labrador has done, Nova Scotia has decided to shut its borders to all but essential travelers as well. The exception, people from PEI, as well as this province. The Premier says it was a difficult but necessary decision. So let's be clear. Thursday, April 22nd at 8 a.m., you cannot come to Nova Scotia from outside PEI or Newfoundland, unless it is essential. If you live in Nova Scotia, but your permanent employment is in another province, you can go back and forth, and this includes rotational workers. If you are a federally approved temporary foreign worker, if you're a specialized worker uh, who is needed for urgent, critical infrastructure work necessary to help the province func function, no other specialized workers will be permitted. So what does this mean for the Atlantic bubble? Well, the premier of this province has been in talks with the other Atlantic premiers and expects the bubble will be delayed. We were all in agreement uh, that, uh, you know, May 3rd may uh, seem a little too optimistic at this point in time. But again, we're, uh, you know, I'm interested in looking at where the puck's going to be down the road, not where it is right now. I know everyone, there's a lot of fear and anxiety out there about what's happening across the country, but there's positive news with respect to vaccines, and as they continue to grow, I think vaccines will, will outpace the variants. A Newfoundlander in Saskatoon decided to make the most of his downtime during the pandemic, undergoing a massive lifestyle change. Oh, Deb, at the start of 2020, Kyle White weighed in at 430 pounds, and in just over a year with exercise and a new diligent diet, he's lost one-third of his body weight. As here now's Jeremy Eaton reports, he's taking it one step at a time and has already set another goal. Kyle White's warm smile beams across the screen from Saskatoon to St. John's. And these days, the man from Old Perlican has plenty to smile about. In a little over a year, White has committed to his health, slashing his waistline from 58 inches to 44. I've been a big guy all my life. 
Uh, I think every day I would wake up heavier than I was the day previous. And uh, I knew that wasn't sustainable. Early in 2020, he stepped on the scale, weighing in at 430 pounds. The global pandemic got White thinking about his lifestyle. We had a lot of bad habits, my wife and I, like a lot of folks did, I think, uh, back in the Tiger King era of the pandemic. We had a lot of takeout, uh, a lot of sitting on the couch, and uh, eventually that didn't feel really healthy. At just 28 years old, White's body agreed. He was experiencing pain in his knees and his back. His doctor told him his blood pressure was too high for his age. So I knew if I didn't change something about how I was living my life, um, that those problems were probably going to get worse down the road. So White hit the street, and despite his size 15 shoe, his exercise journey began with baby steps. He started walking the dog more. Then he picked up hiking, and then his walking turned into running. It didn't begin quickly, <laughs> by no means. Uh, when you're the size that I was, and even still am, you need to be really careful about running because uh, it's very easy to hurt an ankle or a knee or something. First, he ran 500 meters, then a kilometer, then a mile. In the fall of last year, White ran four kilometers without stopping. And then throughout the year, that just built and we started seeing results. Um, it took a lot of hard work, but uh, once we started seeing those results, we were willing to put in more and more work along the way. White hopes to run a 10K later this spring, and his sights are set on a half marathon in the fall, a far different pace than last year. But it's not just fitness. White also reevaluated how he approaches food. He significantly cut back on booze and drinks significantly more water every day. Over the past year, we've just gradually started cutting out more and more animal products from our diet, so that now we're eating a, I would say, a mostly whole food, plant-based diet. To date, he's lost more than 150 pounds, from 430 down to just under 280. It's kind of hard to wrap my head around because that's, that's a whole person. Personally, it feels fantastic when you're able to kind of take care of your body and know that you're giving it your all and you're in more control over your life. Um, all those things really just help you feel better about yourself and live a better life. White hasn't been back to his home province since the fall of 2019, so his family has only seen his transformation through the screen. He says he looks forward to travel restrictions lifting so he can show them all the progress he's made in person. A hug is going to feel quite a bit different, I think. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. Beautiful evening out there as we look at the harbor. We're looking at a quiet couple of days. Rain will move back in as we head towards the weekend, but I'll get into those details coming up.
Ashley, it's a windy old day out there today, but you've been talking about those double digits on the way. When <laughs> should we expect to see those? Uh, in the next couple of days, it's really going to get warm uh, as we start to see this area of low pressure move off and uh, some southwesterly winds move in. Let's take a look at the temperatures today. Not quite there yet, only reaching five degrees in St. John's, two in Gander. Twillingate only reached a high near one degree today. We did see some wet snow uh, or rain mixed with snow earlier today and last night. As we head towards the south coast, though, Burgio, beautiful day today. Saw some pictures on Twitter. Uh, sunshine and 10 degrees for you. And then we've got those temperatures, even mild, uh, relatively speaking, for Lab City, sitting at 7 degrees earlier today and then still hovering near or just above zero along the coast. Temperatures have dropped uh, down to minus 1 in Makovic and then we've got temperatures dropping uh, about one degree for uh, Twillingate down to zero. We're going to see that temperature hover there as we head through the overnight tonight, but with these gusty winds uh, upwards of 50 to 60 kilometers per hour, even some areas seeing upwards of 70 earlier today. We are seeing a bit of a wind chill, so we're going to uh, see that wind chill continue as we head through the overnight tonight and then uh, into the minus single digits and then temperatures are going to climb tomorrow. So we're not going to see too much uh, of a wind or we won't see a wind chill tomorrow afternoon because temperatures are going to get uh, quite mild across the province. And that's as that area of low pressure moves off. Uh, we will see that return of some milder air. So here's where we're uh, looking at today or this right now. We're seeing some showers along the west coast. And then that uh, shower activity for portions of Bonavista North through to the northern Avalon will generally continue as we head through the overnight tonight. Uh, even toward anywhere really along the northeast could see that potential for flurries as we head after midnight. That's when that will change over and then it should end overnight tonight. We'll see some light snow move in for Labrador and then clearing skies the story or at least partly cloudy skies the story tonight for the west and the south. Uh, light winds for you as well, so it'll be a relatively nice night. However, temperatures will dip into the minus single digits, hovering near or just above zero uh, for most of central and eastern Newfoundland. The winds will die down just a little bit. Northwesterly is looking anywhere from 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. Flurries a story for Labrador, like I said. Lab West will see some light snow tonight hovering around minus two and we could see anywhere from two to five centimeters of snow as we head into the early morning hours and then even more snow uh, as we head through tomorrow likely going to see somewhere between uh, five to ten centimeters of a wet snow falling through the day on Wednesday. There's that snow there. It's going to make its way towards central Labrador as we head through the afternoon uh, on Wednesday and then change over to the potential for some showers. And that's because some of the warmer, milder air will move in. We might see some snow mixed with rain uh, for western areas as well. And then that will head towards coastal Labrador as we head into the evening hours. Not a whole lot happening for the island. We'll see a cloudy start to the day. Then things should actually clear, uh, clear out quite nicely towards the evening hours. We may see a few showers, spotty showers uh, in the morning along the west coast and then through the day. Uh, through central and then really along the northeast coast before some more rain or showers will move in Thursday morning for the south coast. There's your temperature. Should reach the double digits for most of us tomorrow afternoon. 10 to 11 degrees. I have St. John still staying at 9 tomorrow uh, with a little bit of cloud cover. Keeping things generally cloudy for Gander. However, you will likely see some sunshine as the day goes on. And then winds will be uh, generally a little bit breezy or a little bit brisk. 20 to 40 kilometers per hour will make it feel a little bit cooler than what it is. And then we've got that snow, like I said, up across Labrador. Clearing skies eventually or may see a few peaks of sun in the west as the day goes on. So Thursday's forecast looks even better with temperatures reaching the teens, but I'll get into those details in your long range forecast coming up. It didn't need to have a specific mention in the budget. Um, you know, we are committed to working with the province on this uh, end of story. We've heard what's in the federal budget, but what was left out? Peter Cowan speaks with the Natural Resources Minister right after the break.
The federal government has opened the spending taps. The budget announced yesterday has more than $100 billion in new spending to deal with the pandemic and beyond. So what's in it for this province? Well, Seamus O'Regan is the federal minister for natural resources and he joins us now. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Peter. So child care is one of the big new initiatives. You want to reduce the cost by 50% and then down to just $10 a day by 2025. But there's a bit of a catch. The provincial government has to contribute. So how realistic is that considering the financial problems this province faces? Well, the, pro the, the province and the premier had made a commitment, you know, that they wanted to reach uh, $25 a day. So, you know, we know that um, uh, they are, this is definitely their intention. This is where they want to go. We'll discuss that with the province, but we know, you know, this is definitely where we want to go. I mean, the finance minister, uh, you know, acknowledged the fact that she has three children. Uh, she uh, has a working mother and, and called childcare what I know a lot of friends of mine have called it. It's a second mortgage. I mean, for the amount of money that you have to pay. Uh, to look after your kids. So getting this down to $10 a day on average right across the country uh, is, a, is not just the right thing to do, and it is the right thing to do, but economically it is the best thing that we could do because we've learned an awful lot from this pandemic. It has exposed and kind of accelerated trends that we could see. We knew that, you know, not having, that having uh, unreasonably expensive childcare in this country was holding back women in the workforce. When we hold back women in the workforce, we're not getting the best talent in the workforce that we need to continue to drive our economy. This is an economic imperative as well as I think the right thing to do. Let's talk about some of the things that we didn't see in the budget. Uh, if you were looking closely for Muskrat Falls or any talk of mitigating the impending spike in hydro rates, that wasn't in there. Why didn't that get a mention? Well, I think because the work is ongoing. I mean, we've been working on Muskrat Falls for some time um, and, and, you know, I don't need. We don't, I don't need to get into uh, into the delay from the campaign and from the election. Um, that did not stop our officials from continuing the work that needs to be done, um, and they uh, they've been doing that. I can tell you that we're all back at the table. We were uh, as soon as the new government was formed. Um, so you know, and everything is on the table. We have made commitments about Muskrat Falls. We want to help the province see see you know see us through this. Um, so it didn't need to have a specific mention in the budget. Um, you know, we are committed to working with the province on this, uh, end of story. Um, and the negotiations are, are ongoing, but we're committed to finding a result. Now, looking at this budget, there wasn't really much that was specifically for the oil and gas sector. So how does this budget help me if I'm an unemployed offshore oil worker in this province? So we've got $2 billion over the next three years in, in what I would call not retraining, but retooling. Um, because we need our oil and gas workers in order to accomplish two things, to lower emissions and to build renewables. But you can do all the retraining you want. Right now, there aren't jobs in this province to build wind turbines, for example, or these other renewable things. So even if you get people retrained, where are those jobs in Newfoundland and Labrador? I can tell you that there's nothing that consumes more of my time than thinking about oil and gas workers uh, and energy workers uh, in this province and in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, you know, we're on the cusp of doing a lot of these things. And, you know, I've, I've, I lead a department of, of scientists who are looking at things like carbon capture storage, both onshore and offshore, um, that are looking at all sorts of things. We, we committed $400 million, $75 million to an emissions reduction fund for this province, $320 million that we gave to the province, uh, you know, at the table with unions and with industry to, to figure out in basically two things that we asked them to do you know, uh, make sure that workers are looked after and lower emissions. And uh, and so, you know, they are at that table with a sizable pot of money. We've seen some of it already already spent um, and invested. And, you know, and that will continue, you know, over the next few months. Uh, that's my overriding priority, as it was out west when we put $1.7 billion towards Orphan and an act of wealth, cleaning those up. Because, you know, we know all too well in this province what it is to, to lose talent. We can't afford to lose talent. I got to make sure that oil and gas workers stay in the game because we need them in the long haul to, to lower emissions, to build renewables. Minister, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks, Peter. Today, the province's interim health accord report was released. Now, the goal of the task force is to figure out a 10-year plan to improve health in Newfoundland and Labrador. Joining me now are two of the task force leaders, Dr. Pat Parfrey and Sister Elizabeth Davis. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Carolyn. Welcome. 
So this report takes a really close look at the state of health care in the province, how we got here. It looks at the factors that lead to illness in the province, services and outcomes, and how much it all costs. So Dr. Pat Parfrey, is this report meant to highlight the problems or offer ways to fix them? Well, it's doing a number of things, uh, Carolyn. One is it's making a compelling case that we need to change. Secondly, it's telling the people what we have heard from various ways of, of engaging with the public and engaging with stakeholders and engaging with government. And then it's pointing out a set of directions that have arisen from our strategy committees using that information uh, that are going to lead to change in several different areas. It's going to lead to change in the fact that we are now going to think about social and health systems together. We're going to think about communities and delivering care in communities. And you mentioned uh, looking at the social aspects of healthcare and uh, Sister Davis, that's one of your specialties having worked at the Gathering Place. Can you talk about one thing that can be done to make a difference in that area right away? I'm not quite sure what that one thing will be, Carolyn. That will be the next step. However, what we do know, one of the highest indicators of how ill people are is around poverty. And that includes such things as food insecurity, poor water supply, housing insecurity. Uh, so what we will be doing in the second phase, which follows this first phase, is talking to people about which of those factors, social, economic, or environmental factors, they think that we should try to intervene in. One interesting one that's been brought forward, for example, would be support for universal basic income, which tries, I think, success, successfully tries uh, in many instances to reduce stigma around poverty, brings everybody to the same playing field, if you will. And Dr. Parfrey, you've been very outspoken in the past about unnecessary spending in the healthcare system. And we, of course, know that healthcare takes a huge chunk of government money at a time when we have a massive debt. So after looking at the entire system in this report, 120 pages here, where do you think we can start saving money? I didn't think about saving money at all. Um, the what we all we've what we're trying to uh, advise upon is for the given fiscal envelope of the province, how would we best deliver care? And we strongly feel that we need to rebalance social and medical spending. We need re rebalance spending in the community for the medical system, and within hospitals. And it's that's the that's the arena that we're we're engaged in. The government will, can, will determine the, using a democratic approach to determine the fiscal envelope, and we need to change how we spend that money. Will the final report perhaps offer some suggestions in that area, potential ways where money could be saved? We will undoubtedly make strong recommendations across the gamut of these areas that we're talking about, across the social determinants of health, across community care, across hospital care, across care for the aging, uh, quality measurement and using digital technology, we'll make strong recommendations of how we best see things delivered using those six strategies. You might think that this is ju just a bunch of platitudes and that we're not dealing with the issues, but the reality is that these directions that we're moving to have very strong agreement amongst the public that were attended our virtual town halls We've got the unions and the regional health authorities and the other major players that are in the health and social systems on board. And we have the agreement of the government. So we are much further ahead in terms of trying to make, have an accord than we were when we started or than we were last week. Okay, Dr. Pat Parfrey and Sister Elizabeth Davis, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank Karen. you very much, Carolyn.
are about to meet some of the local faces behind the Black Lives Matter movement. It's part of our ongoing series, Being Black in NL. And tonight, the co-founders share how they got started and the importance of having open conversations about racism. Hi, I'm Ife Alaba, and this is Being Black in NL. Today, we're going to speak to the founders of Black Lives Matter NL. So how did you and when did you guys get started? Black Lives Matter and Newfoundland kind of started impromptu through various Facebook messages. Um, it was, it first started where during the George Floyd killing, it was a time where we saw a lot of people rallying and we decided that this was a time to, let's talk about racism here in Newfoundland. A lot of times there is this um, knowledge, oh, People in Newfoundland are friendly, and people in Newfoundland are really friendly, but this doesn't mean that racism does not exist. We started off with just the rally in mind. To be present at that rally was, it was really amazing simply to see so many people come out in the beginning of a pandemic. Everyone was just so interested, and I feel like we were really channeling all of the real issues of systemic oppression that is prevalent in our society. As um, Black Lives Matter and all, what is your vision and what is your mission? A lot of people consider Black Lives Matter, Newfoundland and Labrador to be just an activity group against uh, racism, but that's not all that it means, right? Because as the name implies, Black Lives Matter. Um, Black Lives Matter doesn't just mean stopping racism because stopping racism doesn't really do much for Black lives that are already suffering from the effects of racism, right? So Black Lives Matter, it means, you know, trying to uh, make Black lives prosper within the current society, right? Trying to do all the activities we can to make sure that there's um, Black prosperity within Newfoundland and Labrador, as well as uh, Canada. Although it might be uncomfortable for some people to talk about um, racism, why is it um, important to have an open and honest conversation about it? When you're able to speak about it, it actually clears up a lot of the, I, I, I want to say ignorance, but I don't want to say ignorance because of the fact that at, at a point in time, we kind of have to step away from the, oh, well, I didn't know, because I think that as society, we need to look at not the intention okay. of the action, but what harm the actual action actually caused. And that's something that I see a lot in my anti-racism cur cur curriculum. Uh, our major focus, because a lot of the problems we we've, we've encounter with, with racial talks is the ignorance, right? Um, I'm going to say ignorance because that's that's pretty much what it is. Um, you see a lot of well-meaning people, which is the worst, right? Well-meaning people just say really hurtful things without knowing and the whole time they're trying to do good. So when you actually reprimand them on that, it feels like an attack. While yeah. the whole time they're trying to minimize you without knowing that, even if whether they know it or not, I'm not sure, but um, that's why we're trying to focus on education because the more we can teach people about racism, the more we can um, let people know how exactly how to relate with um, Black people. What would you say to people who do not believe racism exists in here in Newfoundland and Labrador and how would you explain that to them? From my personal perspective, I would share my personal, my story, my, what, what has happened to me and from there and try and educate the person and try and educate them on systematic oppression. Just look at your institutions, look at the leaders in your institutions. Do you see any black people there? Francis probably no. Why are there more black people or people of color doing more, um, what's it called? Uh, menial labor jobs, um, unskilled labor jobs. Just look at that. That's not a, that's not a personal problem of like those individuals that's an institutional problem yeah. institutions you know working to keep them there so just look at the reality of the society and see where black people are located and see as as compared to you know the white counterparts and granted yeah. there's majority of white people here but that shouldn't like you should, when you compare percentages it should show that it shouldn't show one person being disproportionately or one race being disproportionately disadvantaged than the other it should just show the, the same proportions if it's an equal society. But well, fortunately, it's not, and therefore, you know, the numbers will show you that. How do you combat racism as people? Like, what steps can we like, take? There's racism on the large scale that, that, that affects us every day. 
in terms of we call it systemic oppression, um, but we also have racism that affects us day to day, and it affects everyone who well, who is black, and it affects us in different ways. It could come about in terms of like yeah discrimination, like um uh, maybe if your name wasn't so ethnic stuff like that. Those little micro uh, microaggressions. I think that a way to combat that to the average person in society is to, like I said before, try to have these conversations, try to do some thinking within yourself, take up the onus within, on yourself to like research, to really understand and then have those conversations, figure out why this is wrong or, uh, or like what is really, like try to really take ourselves out of that, ex that exceptionalism thing where we feel like if, you know, this doesn't really affect us, so it doesn't really matter. It does. When we're in key decision spaces, key spaces that we know are key decisions are being made, we always it's always important to look around, look where you are and say who is not being represented yeah. in this decision, um, who should be the center of the conversation. A lot of times um, we need to, people aren't put at the right center of the conversation. So it's always important to look around, be, who is the ones making the decisions here as well. And also is one thing Brian mentioned earlier is that what we see a lot of time is when we analyze systemic oppression is that we see a lot of um, black people, a lot of people of color do the manual work and not being in maybe like being an executive of a company as well. I think we should attack this from a more philosophical perspective, right? Um, when we look at how racism can be. Racism is not an art, it's not a natural thing, right? Racism was deliberately created to, you know, keep black slaves, you know, in, in USA or, or whatever. Um, so it's, it wasn't something that naturally happened because judging people on the color of their skin is the most ridiculous thing ever. Um, it had to be made. There was a lot of propaganda done. If you look at like the you know the tv shows or the newspaper from back then or even the scholar scholarly articles it was all propaganda made to you know elicit to create racism however what we've done has just been to pull out the knife um to use an analogy like we we just stab someone and we pulled out the knife and we're like go about your day right so that's not that's not how you do that's not how you go about healing you have to make deliberate actions to counter the actions you've done before right say let's say someone dumped oil in the in the, in the dam or in the water and everyone has to swim in that that's pollution right because that's what racism does in our society it pollutes it you can't just be like stop dumping oil the one already in it is a problem so we have to consciously try to remove that which is what which is why groups like you know black lives matter exist um is because they need to be a conscious effort a conscious action towards eliminating racism um, one of the things we're trying to push is to create a curriculum um, in, in the schools here, right? Um, so there's an actual anti-racism teaching in school, the same way there was back then. Like the, the, the ideologies that we've created and we've built on as a society that has led to this has to be undone. And that's how we need to combat racism. So yes, we need to tell people to you know, personally stop doing microaggressions like my um, colleague has said, and we need to, um, create, you know, affirmative action, like Precious has mentioned, affirmative action whereby we put people who we know deserve to be in a management position, because a lot of the people that come here, let's look at like immigrants or international students, or they all are very qualified to get this position, but they just don't have the access. So uh, th there's no way people will be like uh, sending your resumes and equal competition, they don't care about race. That's a problem because it, I don't think it's quite equal if my name causes a problem. If you already have a predisposed thinking about me, then it's not equal. It's you already judged before you even saw my application. And even if you don't want to judge, you already are in a society. You're already in the oil water. So you can't do anything about it except try to make conscious effort towards taking out that oil. So a conscious effort has to be made. You know, we need to start moving in direction towards um, eliminating racism with actual activity rather than just, you know, um, token efforts. That's it from me, your host, Ife Alaba, and thank you so much for watching another episode of Being Black in NL. Stay tuned for more.
Well, to the United States now for a major story. A jury has just reached a verdict in the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count one, unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. Just minutes ago, a jury found Chauvin guilty on all charges in the death of George Floyd. Chauvin had pleaded not guilty to second degree unintentional murder, third degree murder, as well as second degree manslaughter. Floyd, an unarmed black man, died after the officer pinned him down during an arrest last May and knelt on his neck for more than nine minutes. The jury heard nearly three weeks of emotional testimony as well as expert opinions. Floyd's death inspired a racial reckoning, igniting protests across the country and beyond over the issue of police brutality. Big story for sure, and uh, CBC will be tracking all of the reaction to that story, so you can go to our website at cbc.ca slash nl for all of that. Well, uh, Ashley, looking ahead now for the weather, the long range, those double digits on the way. <laughs> yes, they are. Thursday looks beautiful as far as temperatures go. However, we are going to see some rain move in as the day goes on. Let's take a look at the future tracker for the afternoon. You can see that rain reaching the south coast as we head into the... Um, morning hours and then that'll continue to track north as we head through the day and we're going to see that encompass most of the island through the afternoon and then across Labrador uh, it's looking like we're going to see some snow again for the west and then for central areas of Labrador you should stay on the rain side for most of the day on Thursday but then as we get into Friday morning some cooler air it looks like it'll make an appearance and that means some of the higher elevations along the uh, west coast could see some snow with this one or at least mix with some snow at times and then we're going to see that transition back to snow up across Labrador with coastal areas uh, likely just seeing some flurries or light snow uh, mixed with rain as we head into the afternoon. Saturday looks like it's still going to stay a little bit unsettled at least through the first half of the day. Here's a look at those temperatures I was talking about. 14 to 16 degrees uh, for the afternoon. It looks like, like I said, we'll see some sunshine to start, but that rain will move in through the day. Uh, for the southwest, a little bit cooler into the single digits. Same thing for the northern peninsula. And then across Labrador, you're looking at temperatures around 5 to 7 degrees the further west, you, uh, further east you get. And then for Nain, you're looking at staying on that cold side of that low. So it'll be snow for you, some periods of snow through most of the day. The other thing to note with Thursday is those winds are really going to ramp up as well. Into Friday, temperatures are going to drop back down, but still sit around where we should be sitting, maybe a degree or two above for this time of year. Uh, like I said, that cooler air along the west coast leading to uh, some of the higher elevations, likely seeing some snow in the mix. That should be rain from central eastward uh, through the afternoon. Eight degrees in St. John. Similar temperatures through central Marystown, hovering around seven degrees. And then we've got those temperatures around two degrees for Lab City as the daytime high and Happy Valley Goose Bay at about six. As we look ahead for the next five days, we will see a return of those double digits. It looks like as we head towards the end of the weekend, uh, Saturday likely going to see a few showers, but overall generally clearing. And then Sunday, like I said, looks beautiful and 11 degrees. We've got those temperatures pretty similar, a little bit of a dip for Friday and Saturday, eight to nine degrees. So still quite nice by to, uh, 12 degrees by Sunday and then for the west coast again the higher elevations seeing the potential for flurries but temperatures should warm up quite nicely by the time Sunday rolls around. Across eastern Labrador you're seeing unsettled conditions right through the weekend by Sunday it looks like that should all fall as rain as your temperatures hover around 8 degrees and then lab west you're still looking at your temperatures around 2 to 5. Wanted to quickly share this photo on the road to Twillingate. Tara shared that one with us or Tara. Thank you for that. If you have any weather photos and now photos at cbc.ca. Well, that's a nice shot. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Hope you can join us again tomorrow night. Good night. Good night.